Evening all. I don't know, if you're like me, you're th absolutely thrilled by the Falcon 9 uh, Dragon X space launch um, yesterday. Godspeed, uh, Doug and Bob. Sounds like two guys on a fishing trip, doesn't it? Uh, in space! So, um, this has been fantastic, especially in these difficult times where we've got this, this awful rioting going on and with the, the lockdown and coronavirus. I think it's, it's just amazing that we can still do something. The human race put people into space. And, and the rocket itself is exciting. You know, the design is new. It's radical. It's, it's, a, it's a big departure from the rocket systems and the spacecraft systems with hitherto known this is you know touchscreen technology rather than having just wall-to-wall uh, -wall buttons switches and circuit breakers and just sort of cargo rammed into every crevice of a very cramped spaceship um the landing of the first stage back onto a floating platform this is just we, we are living in fantastic times uh, with this technology and hopefully it will take people from horrid navel gazing and and kind of nihilism and that's what space flight has always done it's stopped nihilism and people look upwards and, and are inspired now it hasn't inspired everybody it has inspired Aaron Bastani he of Navarro Media and Luxury Communism because he tweeted out yesterday that in 1961 uh, the Soviet Union the USSR Put a man into space 2020 and he showed a clip of um the uh a falcon 9 rocket by spacex exploding he said 2020 the private sector explosion catastrophic explosion now some of his more moronic followers thought that there were astronauts actually on board that capsule um well the fact is that's not from 2020 that that explosion clip that's from 2019 it's from last year where spacex were testing a Falcon 9 booster and um, there was a failure the rocket blew up there was nobody on it uh, no technicians were killed because they moved them well out of the way when such an explosion or when a launch happens so it's um, you know the, the most moronic comment was uh, you know t um, two families have lost a loved one Elon Musk all for Elon Musk's ego it's all demented because that's just not true the reality is, these kind of failures and explosions of very new rocket systems are not that uncommon. They've um, existed all throughout the history of spaceflight. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of that history, because that's how I roll. And hopefully, if Aaron Bastani does catch this, or some of his followers and fans catch this, I'm hoping I can explain um, just why his tweet uh, was misleading and ignorant of uh, rocket rocket engineering, rocket science. So, um, back in the early 1930s, um, there are various uh, groups around the world trying to build liquid fueled rockets. The Americans were the first in 1926, a man called Dr. Robert Goddard, um, a physicist, uh, built the first liquid fueled rocket, sent it up uh, a little bit into the atmosphere. And then in the 1920s and 30s, uh, there was a group in Germany of young uh, rocket scientists led by Hermann Erberth and Werner von Braun. This was in the late Weimar Republic, started building first rockets there. And in the Soviet Union, a um, group of young rocket engineers called, who had the collective name Gernd, I think Gern, that was it, um, were building rockets. And their star uh, member was a man called Sergei Korolev. Now, Korolev uh, was building these experimental rockets and the Gern Group uh, received patronage from sectors of the military and the uh, Science Academy. But what happened was in the late 1930s, Stalin had his purges. A number of the uh, people that were sponsoring this group fell found they were executed or imprisoned. Korolev himself was sent to the Gulag. During the Second World War, uh, they found out that Korolev was still alive in a gulag and that they really needed him because, um, you know, uh, the Soviet Union needed all the help it could get in fighting the Germans. So they let him out of the gulag and told him he had to start working on rocket weapons uh, to help win the war. So immediately after the war, 
the Americans and the Russians want to get hold of German V2 rockets because they can see the potential of such weapons. And the Americans go and capture Werner von Braun and a few of his team and a few V2 rockets. But the Soviets uh, managed to get hold of a few V2 rockets themselves. And they got Korolev uh, working on them to reverse engineer them to see if he could come up with something better. And so by the mid to late 1950s, uh, Korolev and von Braun, working respectively for the Soviets and uh, NASA, are starting to design and build the first rockets that will hopefully um, put satellites into orbit and then eventually a human being into space. Now, on both sides, in the Soviet Union and the uh, Amer and, and in America, <clears throat> these rocket tests um, often started with failure. You know, they didn't get it right first time. They tried a rocket, it exploded, um, made notes, made changes, tried again. Sometimes it exploded and kept trying until they got the rocket to work. By 1957, October 1957, the Soviets got their R7 rocket to work and they put Sputnik 1 into orbit. But that was after a lot of tests and a lot of failures. And this was true of the Americans and it kept going from 1957 to 1961. They were developing other rockets and trying to improve uh, them so they could carry a heavier payload, which would be uh, a human being. And again, you know, there were failures. Now, Korolev's R7 rocket wasn't the only one being built in the Soviet Union at that time. He had rival designers and uh, some rivals in the team had designed another rocket that they thought would be more powerful than Korolev's. And it, but it relied on a very experimental, unstable fuel. And what happened in 1960 was that they were preparing to launch one of these rockets with the unstable fuel. And reports are, I mean, it's not 100% certain what caused the ignition, but reports say that the Soviet general in charge of the whole uh, scheme was smoking near the rocket and a discarded cigarette ignited some spilt fuel from uh, the missile and ignited the whole lot and it was this giant fireball. It was just this, um, all this unstable rocket fuel just went everywhere and it doused all the technicians and military personnel and engineers that were um, in close proximity to the rocket and scores of men, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's a big death toll, just got covered with this fuel, it ignited and they turned into human fireballs. And you can see this, there's a, a film footage of it, on YouTube of just men running and on whilst on fire. And this was a huge catastrophe, a disaster. The Soviet Union suppressed the news of this for a while. But by, so they did shift back to Korolev's design and by 1960, April 1961, they were ready to put a man into space. Now, it went really down to the wire between whether the Americans or the Soviets would put the first man into space. The Soviets weren't exactly the, the clear leaders in this. Um, the Americans could have put somebody into space before the Soviets had they not been extra cautious and insisted in sending a chimpanzee in the rocket first to see if the chimpanzee would survive. And the chimpanzee came back alive. But whilst they were processing that data, the Soviets put Yuri Gagarin into space and they, they won that round. Um, now, over the next few decades, when uh, designing and building new uh, rocket systems, the ones that would propel bigger spacecraft carrying uh, more than one person um, into higher orbits and to do more complicated maneuvers, such as docking two spaceships or even going to the moon. These new rockets would be tested. Sometimes there'd be engine explosions, sometimes there'd be fuel expo explosions, all on unmanned uh, rocket systems. That's what they do. They test, something breaks, they know what to fix for next time. This is cutting edge technology. It's and There really weren't the kind of computer simulations and computer modeling that we have now in design. Back then, they just had to build the thing 
to the best of their knowledge and ability and see if it worked and didn't explode. And if it exploded, they would go over the wreckage. They would also film each launch from multiple camera angles that would scan the footage to see if what went wrong and try and put it right. Now, um, the Americans at this time in the mid to late 60s just shot straight ahead of the Soviet Union. Sorry, Aaron, but they did. And uh, the Soviets had two systems. They had the N1 uh, moon rocket that never worked, never, it never succeeded in flying more than 20 seconds before it exploded. They gave it a few launches, never, never got near space, the N1 rocket. Far too complicated, it kept exploding. But they had disasters with their successful Soyuz rocket. Now, the Soyuz has been immensely successful. Um, it's been in um, uh, service pretty much since 1968 without, with, uh, I think, only one uh, uh, fatality. Now, this is since 1968. There was a fatality in 1971. In 1967, the first Soyuz um, was a disaster. They didn't test it enough. And they put a cosmonaut in it, a man called Komarov, Vladimir Komarov, I think his first name was, um, but Komarov was the pilot of um, Soyuz 1. And they hadn't tested enough, and it was thought to be um, too dangerous to fly. But political pressures, political pressures on the Soviet ge government, Aaron, uh, demanded that this flight take place. So Komarov blasted off into space, into orbit, and the Soyuz capsule was just failing left, right and centre. The solar panels that would get its power from, from the sun um, didn't deploy properly. He had power failures, he had uh, communication problems, uh, trying to control the craft was a huge problem. And at this stage, uh, both Komarov um, and the Russian um, mission control felt that it was very doubtful he would make it back alive. And sure enough, upon they brought him back as soon as up there and they couldn't fix anything. They brought him back as soon as they could, um, aborted the rest of the uh, mission and what he was supposed to do. Um, but the parachutes didn't deploy. That was a failure of the system, possibly caused by the fact that the batteries required to deploy the parachute system properly weren't properly charged because the solar panels didn't deploy and get enough energy. So the uh, parachutes failed and his capsule hit the ground, killing him. And so uh, that's because they uh, tested enough because there were lots of political pressures and there were political wranglings within the Soviet space agency at that time. Korolev died the year before and uh, there was a, a kind of vacuum, like a knowledge and skills vacuum and also a power vacuum because Korolev basically, very unusual for the Soviet Union at that time, but he basically made the Russian space agency in his own image. You know, he was the one, one genius who um, basically ran ran a whole organization in the Soviet Union just the way he wanted it. Um, so, yeah, and going into other um, systems, technology, you know, even rockets designed purely to carry satellites into orbit or to launch satellites to other planets often have these failures. It is not uncommon. And for Bastani to say, oh, well, it's a private sector rocket, it went wrong, is just showing ignorance of the subject. If you don't know anything about a particular subject, it's always best to do a bit of research before taking to Twitter. Um, there's just other things to note here that um, this isn't the first time a private company has been involved in spaceflight. With the American Space Agency, with NASA, it's always been the case. But the, the difference is that before NASA, with US government money, would approach the private aviation companies like McDonnell Douglas, North America, Rockwell, or uh, Grumman, and just say, look, this is what we want to do in space. And um, these are our design specifications. Build us something to these specifications and the companies would do it. Um, this time, 
SpaceX, uh, and, and back then when they built an Apollo or they built a Gemini or, or, or something like that, it would be turned over to the US government. It would be US government property. This time, the SpaceX, the Falcon 9, is owned, designed by uh, SpaceX. They know roughly what uh, NASA wants the Falcon 4 and the Dragon capsule. They know what they want it for. But SpaceX own the uh, equipment. They own the rocket. They own the capsule. And there's nothing stopping. If you wanted to, if you had the money to buy a Falcon 9 and a Dragon capsule off SpaceX, you could do it. You could ride. In theory, if you had enough money, you could ride in the same equipment that Doug and Bob are in right now. You know, and this is this is the difference. This is the shift. And um that it's opening up space flight and as i said at the start of this there's something romantic about space flight that makes us stop being so nihilistic and looking up and thinking yeah this is this is possible it shows the best of the human mind at work space flight so you know godspeed doug and bob and elon and Everybody else at NASA and SpaceX, you've done a you've done a great job, and you've hopefully you've inspired a whole bunch of people to get interested in the possibilities of space exploration again. <laughs> da, 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 da.